Thank you, Andrea. That's a mouthful. <laughs> so yeah, so we're going to, I'm going to break this down into a couple sermons. We'll get through it by 27, probably. <laughs> um, so first of all, welcome, uh, Crownies. We're glad to have you here. Um, we were going to do it outside. Um, when we called the weather on Thursday, the winds were supposed to be 16 miles an hour, and it was supposed to be like 105 degrees, it feels like, but it's not, obviously, 16 more not miles an hour, but it feels gross out there, so I think we're happy we're in here. Um, my name is Andy. For those of you who are new, I'm one of the elders here at Waterbrook, and uh, it's a lot to get through, so let's start with prayer. God, as we turn to your word today, um, I ask that your spirit, God, would do in us what all of the study and all of the sermon prep in the world could never do, God. Make your word come alive to us. Give us this day our daily bread, Lord, and feed our souls with the words of life. For Christ's glory, amen. I, uh, I walked through this psalm with my daughter a couple weeks ago, and we we're sort of over coffee. We we're talking about it. I'm like, okay, so what do, you, what do you think? What'd you get? And she just right away, she pointed to it, and she said, well, right away in the beginning here, in Lord, in you, Lord, I've taken refuge. I'm good. I'm set. He's got me. And that's kind of what it says in the beginning, and that's kind of what it says in the end. So it's a pretty heavy psalm. It can be a pretty heavy psalm, but start with that knowledge. That as we walk into this, he's got you. It's a roller coaster of emotions. The vicissitudes of human experience, if anybody here would use that word, which I didn't until a youth group student taught it to me. Um, <laughs> if Dory was here, she'd use it. Um, most of the commentators that I read, um, you know, so there are a couple events in David's life that they could associate this psalm with. Uh, they could associate it with when he was on the run from Saul, when he had been, been usurped by Absalom, any of the myriad of times he was being, you know, uh, threatened by, by Arab neighbors. Um, and uh, there's also some allusions to language used by the prophet Jeremiah, but as Spurgeon says, we need to look no farther than the instruction to the choir master, a psalm of David, to establish the author's identity. And that said, um, it could have been any of them, it could have been all of them. He didn't have the easiest life, and this was probably a common lament of his soul. And this psalm walks us through how David, a man after God's own heart, experienced suffering. And the psalmist's approach to this situation is worth emulation, and it's his hope within the situation that we find the same comfort in. Now, maybe you are being driven by your home by a son who wants to usurp your throne and assume authority over your kingdom maybe you are the rightfully anointed king and you're on the run from a paranoid incumbent of a nation maybe that's your reality i don't know and certainly for christians in parts of the world china iran morocco north korea the kind of persecution and threat to david's safety described here is a real concern and the parallels to the believers lives are not simply metaphorical the threats to their safety are real, and they're unrelenting. But here we are in suburban America, I don't know. Maybe you just feel crushed by the weight of your own sin. Maybe you're plagued by the memories of mistakes and you're living in fear that you're not done dealing with them yet, or they're not done dealing with you. Maybe the pressures of the world are pushing in around you and you feel like you've got no safe place to flee. You've got no, no, no place that's safe. Maybe it's family strife. It often is, right? There's dissent, there's discouragement, there's disappointment, there's even deception. Or maybe you're trying to navigate the loss or grief and you're buffeted by the effects of life in a fallen world, a world in which everything is subject to decay and disappointment. You're in the middle of a storm of expectations and apathy and helplessness and exhaustion. How do we hold this all together? How do we do this? Maybe you feel like you're over your skis or you're underwater at work and you don't see a way through it. Feeling like people are watching your every move just waiting for you to screw up. We have pressures on every front of our lives from 
work, family, church, school, welcome, (laughs) health, everything. And sometimes it feels like things are so out of control and we don't have the energy to address one of them, let alone all of them. There's just too much happening and there's no place to run. Maybe you're just empty. Maybe your eyes are just weak with sorrow and your soul and your body with grief. Your strength is failing and you feel like, as Bilbo Baggins said, butter scraped over too much bread. Can I say that I think that's the reality of the Christian life way more than we feel like we have liberty to say it is? And that's why these songs are in here. That's why the Psalms are here, walking us through the spectrum of human experiences, showing us that we are not experiencing something for which God is unprepared to deal or which is outside of the scope of his grace. It shouldn't be lost on us that fully a third of the Psalms are songs of lament given to us so that we could see that the scripture dealt with the full scope of our humanity and that while some trust in horses and chariots, we trust in the name of the Lord, our God. Our enemy tries to get us to believe the lie that we can do this without God. But does our hope come from our ability to grit our teeth and bear our way through this life without ever having to admit our faults or our weaknesses? Does the psalmist say, my eyes look in the mirror from where my help comes? My help comes from myself, who most days can hardly remember to put on his pants before his shoes. (laughs) No, my help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth, the author of life and of death's defeat, the only one to ever make a promise that he actually had the power to keep. And David knew that about God, which is why even when the situation seemed hopeless, even when he seemed like he was at his end, that his life was all but forfeit, he could take God at his word. He could trust that God would keep the covenant he made with Abraham when God and God alone walked between the divided animals as a fire pot and a torch in Exodus 15. God saying, no, 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 you stay out of this, Abram. This is my promise, my covenant. This is between me and me. There's only one person here who can keep this covenant, and his name starts with I and ends with am. So I want to walk through David's formula here that he introduces us to. People have broken this down a bunch of different ways, but I found four words that um, they teach us something about approaching God with our demands. Those four words, just so you know where I'm going, are resting, pleading, trusting, and rejoicing. And we'll kind of see as we go through the ups and downs. I tried to use a roller coaster as an analogy, but I don't know if like the up is the hard part because then the down is the fun part. So I don't like roller coasters, so the analogy was lost on me. So... But it starts with David resting in God's covenant promises. I, for one, think it's helpful to recognize that much like Paul's letter uh, to the Colossians, for instance, this isn't just 24 verses of correcting, right? I can't have it broken into fourths because it's sort of broken into fourths, and only one-fourth of it articulates David's lament, and he doesn't even start with it. I think that's important. Note this, first of all, when speaking of things like faith or providence, God doesn't expect us to not be human. He doesn't expect us to say, well, I guess that's just the will of the Lord and that's the end of it and and be okay with it. Sometimes these things hurt and if we could avoid it, it's not sinful to want to. And secondly, while 25% of this psalm is David bringing his request to God, 75% of it is David bringing himself to God. He has enough confidence in God to know that no matter how bad things may seem, God is not about to abandon his people or his promises. And right out of the gate here, he doesn't try to explain himself, to justify himself, to make excuses or bargains. First thing he says is, in you, Lord, I have taken refuge. That's where he starts. He's not knocking on the door. He's not making a, um, God, if you're there kind of petition. He runs headlong into the lap of grace. 
He knows the door's open. He charges in. He doesn't demand anything like he deserves it. He pleads for it knowing that God promised it. It's not merit. It's mercy. Says Piper, we do not, we do not merit anything by taking our refuge in God. Hiding in something makes no contribution to the hiding place. All it does is show that we regard ourselves as helpless and the hiding place as a place of rescue. So answering Satan's earlier challenge, the lie propositioned by the enemy, can you do this without God? David cries, no, I can't. Deliver me, God. I've got nothing. I contribute nothing. I merit nothing, God. But deliver me in your righteousness. Turn your ear to me, God. Turn your ear to me. This kind of poverty of spirit and strength he has. This plea here is not David saying, because of all I've done, because I'm your king, because I'm a warrior, listen to me, God. No, this is David on his deathbed, bereft of hope, muttering in weakness, pleading that God would lean in close and put his ear to our lips so that he might be able to catch our near silent utterances, our words of weakness as we might do for a dying person. Please, God, hear me. And I ask not because you owe me anything, but because you promised yourself. Come quickly to my rescue. Please, for your name's sake, not for my glory, but for yours, Be my rock of refuge. And this is how we present ourselves to God, by prayer and petition. Confident, not in ourselves, but in the righteousness and the mercy of our God. One commentator recounted how David's prayer that God would deliver him in his righteousness, it troubled Martin Luther. Luther eventually interpreted this cry in light of Romans 1.17. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. And Luther finally understood what the righteousness of God revealed by the gospel is. It's not speaking of the holy righteousness of God that condemns the guilty sinner, but of the God kind of righteousness that is given to the sinner who puts his trust in Christ like Gabe prayed this morning. And so David falls headlong into the throne room of mercy, trusting in God's promises to deliver his people because he knows that God won't make break a promise, especially one made to himself. And this is, this is so different from how we relate to each other because I think sometimes even how we relate to ourselves. I was watching um, a video the other day by a guy named Ryder Carroll. He invented the, why are there no people sitting in the front row middle here? Um, by a guy named Ryder Carroll who invented the, the bullet journaling method, the Bujo method for, for journaling. And he had one of those three things that will transform your life videos. I'm like, oh cool, it's only three. I can do that. Um, but one of them was honor your word. We have to have a video for someone to tell us that we need to honor our word. His argument though, this is what was interesting, was that we don't often take our promises to ourselves seriously because we know how easily we break our promises to other people. I'll be home for dinner. I'll help you move. I'll mow the lawn this weekend. I'll finish the bathroom this decade. <laughs> and that's just, that's just the little stuff. The stuff that we somewhat have a degree of control over. We just have to leave work on time or be mindful of our commitments and not overbook ourselves or get off Instagram and go mow the stupid lawn. We know how easy it is for us to fudge on the little things, so why would we trust ourselves on the big things? The promises that we make, um, the promises that we make that are completely outside of our power or control, uh, um, our power to control or for which honoring requires a level of sacrifice and fidelity that we just can't summon or maintain, there are those, and since since we um, love to make God, our God, look like ourselves, we assume he's the same way. Or what Voltaire said, God has made man in his image and we have since returned the favor. But remember uh, Balaam's oracles? When 
uh, Balak brought Balaam out to prophesy over Israel's destruction. He's like, get out here and prophesy over Israel's destruction. And in the first oracle, when Balak said, okay, prophesy Israel's destruction, uh, Balaam prophesied and said the prosperity and the spread of the nation of Israel. And Balak's like, what have you done? Well, that's the opposite of what I told you to do. I told you to condemn them and you blessed them. Try again. Right? What you're doing is the opposite of help. And then Balaam says in his second oracle, God is not a man that he should lie or a son of man that he should change his mind. Does he speak and not act? Does he promise and not fulfill? I mean, consider God's zeal. This, is, this blew my mind. Consider God's zeal for preserving his people, his commitment to save his people from their sins. According to Calvin, he says, although the sentence God passed on man was correct, he nevertheless gave his only and much loved son as a sacrificial victim for sins. Get this, by reasons of this amazing and unexpected mercy, God commended his love toward us more greatly than if he had just rescinded the sentence. Think about that. Like, God didn't just say, okay, never mind. You know, like we do when our kids stick out their lip and they pout at us. <laughs> right? He didn't just remove the curse from us as if it never happened. He didn't just wave his magic wand and say, bibbidi bobbidi boo away our guilt. He didn't do that. He gave his only son to satisfy the demands of our injustices against him. That's covenantal love. He promised to be Israel's God forever. It's not enough that he just restored us. Any emotional judge can be manipulated into doing that. But God sent his son to die on our behalf to ensure that such a sentence may never again be imposed on us. This is the grace that David runs to here. This is the mercy he throws himself at, the knowledge that God has said and God will do. All of David's military prowess, resources at his command, his feats of strength, even his scheming, no match for God's pledge to save a people for himself and to make their enemies a footstool for Christ's feet so we wouldn't just be forgiven of sin, but safe from it for eternity. The words in the psalm, into your hands I commit my spirit, deliver me, my faithful God. Is there a safer place to be? It's a fearful thing to be sure, but as the writer to Hebrews reminds us, is what we have, we have confidence like David had, confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way opened for us through the curtain of his body. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Christ went before us in this. He lived a life, suffered to God, and died not just resigning his life despairingly to death and destruction, but with a sure and certain knowledge of the Father's promise of deliverance and resurrection. That's what we have. And here, hopefully, a last bit of comfort we can take from this before we move on is that David was able then to be glad and rejoice in God's love, for he saw David's affliction and knew the anguish of his soul. Not only was David not unseen, but he was not, not understood either. God saw him. God got him. Um, nothing that David starts going into, and that's why it's important that we start out with this first thing, bring yourself to God like this, because none of the stuff that we go into the second, in the second part here is unknown or unfamiliar. Remember when Jesus, what did Jesus say on the cross right before he died? Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. He wasn't just and this, he wasn't just having a bad week or feeling misunderstood. He was being put to death by the people he came to save. He had just spent the night praying over the sins of humanity, pleading for God to take this cup from him. 
sweating drops of blood, enduring a flogging and a crucifixion, having spent six agonizing hours on the cross, used his last bit of strength to call on God to keep his promises. I've done all I can, God. This is on you. God didn't just know of David's afflictions. He knew David's afflictions personally, intimately, and knew that God and only God could be trusted truly with them. Martin Luther, Philip Melanchthon, Jerome of Prague, John Huss, Polycarp, all of them said these words, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit in their final minutes. When Huss and Polycarp were about to be burned at the stake, when David was certain that his life was at its end, the challenge for us, the hope that we take away from this is that we can say this now, not when we're dying. We can still experience the same comfort as David and these other saints hope to secure in their final hours. And I hope that you find today, I hope that we can enjoy, that's interesting when you say, you know, God, you are my rock, so God, be my rock. It's like he knows it, so be it. I hope that we can grasp, enjoy and experience what we grasp in faith that we see these words, which were written some 3,000 years ago, they still point to the same unchangeable God who wants us to have hope today based on the certainty of the hope which is to come. And we can start by resting in God. Rest in that hope. We don't have to wait until heaven for the final judgment to be rendered. Jesus said, it is finished. Right. The verdict is already in. The gospel tells us that this is a reality which must be lived now. I am no less free and no less loved and no less secure than I will be. And that's not based on me. That's based on the word and the will of our covenant-keeping king. And I think that's, whose water is this? Okay. Um, I think that's the most important thing that I, I hope you see here. Like as, as we're moving through this, I want you to recognize that although David certainly hoped to be free from his trials, more than anything, he wanted God to be faithful to his own name. That the glory of the Lord would be shown and known to himself and to his enemies. To those who cling to worthless idols, to the not gods who promise much and deliver disappointment. For the sake of your name, David says, lead me and guide me. Set my feet in a spacious space. Um, I doubt any of the people who breathe the words into your hands, I commit my spirit on their deathbeds or at the fiery stake expected to be removed from their trials. They expected to see the glory of God. That being said, it doesn't mean that we don't bring our laments to God, that we don't plead with God for our daily deliverance. And let him know about the things that are blocking him from our view and the earthquakes and the thunderstorms which are keeping us from hearing his voice or causing us to start doubting his word. Again, like uh, in the letter to the Colossians, for instance, the balance of this text is about God, not about David. Kevin referenced Murray McShane's quote last week. What did he say? For every one look at yourself, take 10 looks at Christ. And this is not because by doing that, we get to turn a blind eye to our own weaknesses and sins. Um, but because in light of Christ's grace, because the beauty, the sweetness, the all-surpassing goodness of Christ and the knowledge that such goodness, righteousness, and beauty is ours because of the cross, it takes our eyes off of our own weakness and it puts it onto God's might. It dwarfs the Goliaths of this world and puts us on the offensive against our own sin. Psalm 18, 29, with your help, I can advance against a troop. With my God, I can scale a wall right? But we have these verses here. We have David's laments. And we can probably go through these line by line, and I have no doubt that something, probably many things, are going to strike a resonant note in most, if not all of us. I'm in distress. My eyes grow weak with sorrow, and my soul and my body with grief. My life is consumed by anguish, and my years with groaning. This emptiness of this angst, this is an all-consuming, immobilizing, soul-sucking lifelessness. It's hard to remember a time in my life when it was anything but this, right? Like Ruth in the, in the, or like Naomi in the book of Ruth when she said, don't call me Naomi, which means pleasant, because call me Mara, because the Almighty has made my life bitter. 
I went away full, but I came back empty. I've got nothing. My strength fails me because of my affliction. I've been treading water for so long. I just can't hold myself up anymore. Some commentators note the word affliction can also be rendered guilt. I'm collapsing under the weight of my own guilt, my own self-condemnation. How could I let it get to this point? I'm the utter contempt of my neighbors and an object of dread to my closest friends. I'm isolated. I'm cut off. Nobody wants to get close to me because of my sorrow or my guilt, or I'm forgotten as though I were dead. I become like broken pottery. People whisper, terror on every side, and they conspire against me. And if they aren't asking, how do I get rid of this clown? It's because they've completely forgotten about me, hoping or at least assuming that I'm dead. I'm a bad omen anyhow. They'd be better off without me. Poets, um, Ryan Whitaker Smith and Dan Wilt, have taken the Psalms and they've made poetic responses to them. Uh, an interpretation of a sort, published in two books called Sheltering Mercy and Endless Grace. I think these are crazy helpful, and sometimes when, when Chris and I are, are reading at night, one of us will read a psalm and the other one will read the poetic response to it. And in Psalm 31, I'm not going to read the whole thing here, but I'd like to read one part now, the part that kind of alludes to these verses. It says, I'm sick with grief. I fear the darkness will overtake me, that In the witching hour, I will vanish from the earth, my soul so splintered and spent, my body so racked with pain that I'll pass from the land of the living into hopeless oblivion. You you said my name is hidden in your heart, etched on a white stone, but here I'm known as forgotten, rejected, humiliated. What a cruel twist of fate when all I wanted was for others to be able to see you in me. If these were the only verses in David's songbook here, this wouldn't be much of an encouragement, would it? And if we didn't start by reminding ourselves of the goodness of God, we might start with our lament and never move past ourselves. But we have to interpret our trials in light of the faithfulness of God and not the other way around. I had uh, asked a friend, just as an aside, if before they knew Christ, new believer, they had ever had a cry out to God moment, you know, even though they didn't believe in God. And they said, there was a time in my life where I felt alone and that there was no one I wanted to talk to about it, mostly because I thought it would be weird to talk to my friends about it. And I didn't want my parents to overreact if I talked to them, I'm not pointing at you, grandma. Um, I didn't want my... My, uh, my parents to overreact if I talked to them about it. I definitely needed to talk to God about how I was feeling because obviously he'd understand. But at that time, I never made the connection that he was what I needed. And the grief that we experience reminds us that we have so much more to live for than this world and its lies. I think it also keeps us from thinking that everyone's okay, despite what they show us on TikTok or Instagram. They remind us that this world and everyone in it is in need of Christ. And without him, they're fighting their battle alone. And even if they're fighting their battle with other people, they're fighting them with other humans, humans with the same hang-ups, weaknesses, and tendencies that they have. Uh, The last issue of Edify, Pastor Kevin had a thing in the beginning that was um, praying for proximity to brokenness. Spurgeon says that grief is a sad market to spend the wealth of our life in, but a far more profitable trade may be driven there than in Vanity Fair. Better to spend our years sighing than sinning. I'm reminded here when Peter, uh, Peter, when Christ bid him to walk on the water, recorded only in Matthew's gospel, Jesus said to him, this is when Jesus walked out to the boat during the storm and the waves, he said, take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, Jesus said. Then Peter got out of the boat. He walked on the water and he came toward Jesus. But when Peter saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You have little faith, he said. Why did you doubt? And then they climbed into the boat and the wind died down. And those who were in the boat worshiped him saying, truly, you are the son of God. 
It starts by Peter seeing Jesus walking on the water. He sees Jesus, he knows what God is capable of, and he says, God, with your help, I can walk on water. So Jesus says, come. And Peter steps out in faith, and he's doing fine until he looks at the waves and the wind. He starts sinking, and then Jesus rescues them, and he gets into the boat, and then Jesus stops the storm. I have a painting in my living room by one of uh, Bruce and Lisa's friends. It's just a painting of um, some thrashing waves. I thought I had a painting. Yes, that's it. Um, Yes, it is crooked on my wall too. (laughs) Um, Really violent, thick, gloppy paint, a lot of knife work and turbulent colors, and it's based not on this passage, but the the verses from Mark 4, when the storm came up on their voyage to the Gerardines, and Jesus was sleeping in the back of the boat, and then he calmed the storm when the disciples thought they were about to perish, and they cried out to him. Um, I came to faith as an adult when my twins were about a year old, and this is one of those early truths that I was taught that made me thankful that I landed in a church that teaches the Bible and not prosperity. Otherwise, I would have become really disillusioned by now. The lesson, as I'm sure you've all heard, is that God doesn't promise that the storms won't come to you, but he does promise to be in the boat. And like David, like Peter, Jesus bids us come. Take him at his word. The devil wants isolation. He wants us to forget the promises and believe that God is less faithful than he is or that his word is as fickle as ours. And even if we're as bad as everybody says we are, and chances are we're worse, consider that unlike man, which gloms on to the strong, successful, influential, popular people, but then abandons, rejects, or cancels them when they teeter on their pedestal, it's not the way of God. He knew us at our worst and bid us come with all of our hang-ups and all of our baggage. Moving on from resting and pleading, we come to the next dip or curve or whatever it is in David's roller coaster of emotion here, and we learn that having presented our laments and our requests to God, we can trust in his future faithfulness. Kind of like how David starts the psalm by boldly declaring that he has taken refuge in God. Now he comes out and proclaims, but in, I trust in you, Lord. I say, you are my God. Spurgeon says, thou art my God has more sweetness than any other human utterance can frame. There's a lot in these verses about God, his promises for deliverance, David's request for God's blessing, vindication over his enemies, submission to God's providence, but David starts here with the strongest and the most glorious declaration that he or any of us can make, you, Yahweh, are my God. That's the most potent thing that any of us can say. It's a reminder to us that God established the covenant, not us. Seven times in the Old Testament, God spoke, either through himself or through his prophets, declaring that he will be our God. He initiated this relationship, not us. He made and sealed the covenant, not us. God kept the covenant, not us. God in Christ fulfilled the covenant and replaced it with a new one, not us. God has always had the initiative. But, but for us to even be able to say freely, you are my God, is a work of grace. But David trusted in the grace so much that even as we just read in the previous verses, the affliction, the persecution, the despair and the dread, David's faith did not fail him and God did not forsake him. Um, my son, Tucker, who drums. He's the one with the hair that goes everywhere. Um, he's pretty good at chess. And I mean, he's, he's pretty good. He's really good. Um, I can play chess. I mean, I know the rules. I know how the pieces go. Um, but I can't play chess. I can play, I can make believe chess, but I can't actually play chess. I don't know if I don't have the intellect for it or if I don't have the patience for it, probably both. He'll try to coach me when he does this. And I will sit down to play together. He tells me what he's thinking as I play and place him. He's like, okay, you place that there. So I think that's a bad move because you wasted that piece. You could have covered 25% more area, but you limited yourself over there. And I'm like, oh, okay. Um, right? It's like, so I'm going to do this, which blocks you there, there, and there. So 
I think it's supposed to be helpful, but it's really intimidating. <laughs> um, he's one of those guys who can see several moves ahead. Like he can see all the possibilities, all the likely outcomes. I mean, I can too. I mean, I can too. Like we sit down to play and he says, okay, white goes first, you're moving. I'm like, okay, I've lost. <laughs> <laughs> check in something, right? I mean, I'm so good at projecting moves that even sitting down to play chess is a commitment to me uh, for losing. And I, I wish I could say that with the kind of trials and the persecution that David faced here, I would be stalwart in my faith. But as you know, I'm a pessimist, at least insofar as I'm concerned. I mean, yeah, if it was dependent on me and my faith, I probably wouldn't get out of bed in the morning. I'd be like Elisha's servant who went to pieces every time it looked like the deck was stacked against me. I'd be like, alas, what should I do? I've lost. But David, in saying, you are my God, reminds himself that this isn't of David's doing. And although his faith may be tested here, God's isn't. David didn't ask to be rescued because David was good. He asked to be rescued, he cried out because God is good. And he's just saying, God, please be God. My times are in your hands. Not just this time, right now, all the times. David acknowledges not only God's sovereignty over every moment of his life, but he knows that if God is who David knows him to be, as he's revealed himself to be, that David is so much better off for it. It's not like my times are in your hands, except for those ones. Look, no, you can have those too, God. He pleads for God's unfailing love to save him. And for the second time in this psalm, pleads that he would not be put to shame, that his faith in Yahweh would not be put to shame. He pleads a portion of the Aaronic blessing. Let your face shine upon your servant. Save me in your unfailing love. Let me not be put to shame, for I have cried out to you. But let the wicked be put to shame and be silent in the realm of the dead. And he cries, Save me from those who would pursue me, who would seek to rob me of my joy in you. From the persecutors, um, put them to shame. Those who persecute, put them to shame. Not for persecuting me, but for the sake of your name, Lord. For ridiculing my confidence in you. And although it may seem like our enemies have the upper hand at times, it may seem like darkness is going to win. Like it's going to overwhelm and it's going to consume us. The Lord's commitment to his covenant to be our God means ultimately that our enemies are the helpless and hopeless ones. Like Elisha's servant on this side of the cross, uh, like Gabe prayed, everything that we see is not all there is. We have the benefit of seeing God fulfill the covenant of Christ, in Christ. If you have trusted Christ as your Savior, then like God opening the eyes of of the servant and showing him the forces of God marshaled around the Arameans, we can see how Satan's schemes have been turned against him. And the thing that presumed would be God's tragic defeat wound up being the most glorious victory imaginable and secured for us an abundance of good things forever. How abundant. How abundant are the good things that you have stored up for those who fear you, that you bestow in the sight of all on those who take refuge in you. You prepare a table for me, Lord, in the presence of these enemies. We don't have words for it. It's indescribable. Like in Ephesians 3, it's like it's searching for words. I, it's immeasurably able to do more than we could possibly ask or imagine. It's like a kid, it's like a bazillion gillion. Like I, just I, I don't have a number this big for how good it is. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever and ever and ever times infinity. Double stamp, triple stamp. <laughs> Even if we can't measure it, we can marvel at it. And we can marvel at God's mercy to us in Christ who secured such a hope for us. The Lord hath promised good to me. His word my hope secures. He will my shield and portion be as long as life endures. And finally, David in this final section here does what all of us should be doing, preaching to ourselves and to each other. Bruce will say often, "Is like, you gotta stop listening to yourself. You gotta start talking to yourself. We should rejoice that God doesn't come by and that... Uh, 
we should rejoice. That doesn't come by looking at our situations. It comes by looking at God. Bruce also, I'm pointing to Bruce a lot. Sorry, it's, just, it's helpful that you're sitting right there. But he also quotes one of my heroes, Alistair Begg, a lot, um, who lamented a church service he attended where the pastor, worship pastor, came out and started with, how y'all feeling? And he's like, well, that was it. I can go home now. That was so good. I'm done. All right, that's great. As if how we feel has any influence over the truth. Don't ask me how I'm feeling for crying out loud, said Beg. Don't ask me what I feel about myself. Ask me what I know about God, what I know about his word, what I know of verity that can deal with my soul. At half past eight in the morning, I'm barely ambulatory. I spilled my coffee. I kicked the dog. I don't even have a dog. I got into an argument with someone. I feel rotten. What do you got for me? Nothing. You've got nothing. And the truth is, for David, is that God showed him the wonders of his love when he was in a city under siege. And even when David's faith faltered and he cried, I'm cut off from your sight. I'm lost. That's it. I've lost. I'm done. We're over. The Lord heard his cry and he rescued him. And this is what we know, that though the storms may suggest to us that God has forgotten us, he hasn't. It's also a caution to us that we shouldn't maintain a sensationalist view of our faith. Unbelief, says Spurgeon, will have a corner in the heart of even the firmest believer. And our response to suffering is often to doubt God, says Tripp. Suffering reminds us that we're not as righteous as we thought and we're not as faithful as we've confessed to be. We lose heart when we don't see God responding the way we want or we expect him to. We start to doubt his faithfulness during these trials as opposed to acknowledging that our faith is the one that's faltering. But take heart. Remember that this isn't our covenant, it's God's. He owes it to himself, says Herman Bevink, to his own covenant, to his own oath, to his own word and promise to remain the God of his people despite all their unrighteousness. Our hope is secure, friends. In the final day, as David prays here, our faith will not be found to be misplaced. And those waves, they can get pretty big. Believe that we have in Christ a sure foundation for our hope. There's a rock of refuge. There's a stone to alight on. I want you to know that you have a God who is fighting for you even when you feel you have nothing left. David had all the feelings in this psalm and he brought them to God but he bookended them with God's truth. And the truth is that God said, I will be their God forever. He has said it. Will he not do it? I'm gonna go back to this book and just read the first stanza um, from this psalm and I pray that it gives you some comfort. Father, my life is a story of your relentless faithfulness to me. A story of how we have walked through this world, you, the covenant keeper, I, the covenant kept. This isn't emotion, this is fact. Jesus has you, praise the Lord. Let's pray. Father God, all we can ask here is for you to strengthen our faith. Lord, that we might walk away from these verses with the same conviction that David had, that you, God, will hold us fast. That you have purchased us from our sin and that through the blood of Christ, who died in the fulfillment of that covenant, ushered in a new covenant. We await, God, that feast with the covenant-keeping king. The feast where there is no death or dying, all of our tears are wiped away, promises are never broken, words of anger are never spoken, and every sad thing is untrue. And until then, Lord, keep us. Be our rock of refuge, I pray. Hear our words of weakness and help us live now in light of how we will live then. For Christ's glory, Lord. Amen.